Gentlemen, what am I bid for this fine, young, healthy, light-skinned servant girl? Eight hundred. Nine hundred. A thousand. In a land where all men are created equal, there exists the peculiar institution, Negro slavery. Some flee from it. Others rise up to fight it. Many give their lives to defend it. It becomes a wound that divides the nation. In 1619, a Dutch ship brings to Virginia a cargo of 20 Negroes. But these first Negroes are not slaves. Like many whites, they come as bondsmen, indentured servants who will be given their freedom in a few years. As Negroes begin to perform every kind of labor, their value on the plantation is more and more appreciated but it is difficult and disturbing to replace and retrain indentured servants every few years when their period of servitude is over. Some white planters begin to ask themselves, why not keep these Negroes permanently? They argue that the black man is already a slave in South America and on the islands of the Caribbean. Why not extend that practice here? The Negro makes an ideal slave. If he tries to escape, his color makes it easy to find him. If he needs to be disciplined, he can be punished because he is a heathen. By 1661, Virginia has laws recognizing and regulating Negro slavery. By 1669, Carolina adopts a constitution which gives every free man absolute power over his Negro slaves. A fateful decision has been reached. The Negro is to serve his master for life and his descendants and their descendants. Slowly, bit by bit, piecemeal, an institution begins to take shape and spread through the colonies. To meet the growing demand for Negro slaves, between 1700 and 1750, Thousands of Negroes are brought to the colonies each year. Crowded into the holds of ships, shackled in irons, naked, chained in their own filth. On the long, grim voyage, it is estimated that one out of every five sickens and dies. But there are always more. In some southern states, slaves begin to outnumber white settlers by more than two to one. While slavery becomes more and more important and profitable on the large plantations of the South, on the smaller farms, and in the factories of the North, slave labor is not so practical or profitable. By the time of the Revolutionary War, slaves make up about one quarter of the population. Of the two and one half million people in the colonies, 650,000 are slaves. But there are also nearly 50,000 free Negroes. In the struggle for American independence, Negroes fight bravely. One of the first men to give his life in the Boston Massacre is the runaway slave, Crispus Attucks. Defending Bunker Hill, Peter Salem and Salem Pool distinguish themselves. But for the new nation, dedicated to the fundamental proposition of liberty, slavery is a contradiction. Having fought a war for freedom, can the patriots now deny freedom? The founding fathers are deeply troubled. 
The New Republic's Declaration of Independence speaks of inalienable rights. Does it exclude these? The new Constitution is designed to give each state representation in Congress according to population. Shall Negroes who outnumber whites in the South be counted as citizens or not? It is the beginning of a long series of compromises. In the Southern states, each Negro slave is to be counted as three-fifths of a person. Already, the fundamental contradictions of slavery to American democracy is recognized in both the North and the South. Thomas Paine is saying, There must be an act of legislation which shall put a stop to the importation of Negroes for sale, soften the hard fate of those already here, and in time procure their freedom. The Ordinance of 1787 prohibits slavery north of the Ohio River. Some southern states are passing legislation encouraging the emancipation of slaves. Some leading planters are making plans to free their people. Many prominent citizens believe that within 20 years, Congress will outlaw the importing of slaves and the institution will gradually wither away and disappear. But as the Industrial Revolution comes to England, the new machines begin to demand more and more cotton. And as cotton becomes the great cash crop, suddenly there is a demand for more and more slaves to plant the crop and work in the fields. In 1808, Congress outlaws the overseas slave trade. But now as fewer and fewer slaves arrive from abroad, on the domestic market, prices double. On the rising market, an infant begins to bring as much as $200. A 50-pound boy can sometimes bring 500. Women become prized and advertised as breeders because they can produce saleable children. As the demand for cotton increases year by year, as new lands open up through the Louisiana Purchase, on the virgin soil of the new southern states, there arises a new kind of plantation. On these huge new plantations, the object is to get rich quick, to cash in on the rising prices of cotton and sugar. Land and people are used up with no thought of the future. Here a slave is a machine to produce or to die. On the domestic market, the trade in human flesh grows increasingly brisk. The price of slaves is very high, but it seems we must have them at any price for fear they will go even higher. Men gamble on slaves as they do on the stock market. Eight hundred, nine hundred, a thousand! Negroes are performing every kind of useful labor. They work as field hands and house servants, as dock workers, barbers, dressmakers, carpenters and bricklayers. They create the graceful ironwork that decorates many southern mansions. They're busy on the plantations and in the cities. And when their masters have no work for them, it is very easy to hire them out and collect their pay. By 1820, there are almost two million slaves. Their value is estimated at more than a billion dollars. And with slaves so valuable, there is less and less talk of the institution disappearing. The institution of slavery is a fixed fact. Emancipation is an idle dream beyond the reach of human power. One of the strangest facts about the institution is that the vast majority of Southern whites own no slaves. The great graceful legendary plantations with over a hundred slaves exist for only a few thousand families. But these planters argue that cared for in sickness and in health all year round, looked after from the cradle to the grave, their slaves are better off than the factory workers in the North who can be thrown out of work to starve. 
When people talk of my having so many slaves, I always tell them it is the slaves who own me. Morning, noon, and night, I am obliged to look after them and to attend to them in every way. On the great plantations of the South, visitors are frequently brought to the Saturday night dances in the quarters when Negroes sing and dance. To the outsider, the Negro is pictured as a happy-go-lucky child who needs looking after all his life. But what slave has ever felt safe enough to present his true face for all the world to see? It isn't he who has looked on that can tell what slavery is. It is he who has endured. I was black, but I had the feelings of any man. A Negro woman who has run away says, I am now my own mistress. I can do my own thinkings without having anyone to think for me, to tell me when to come, what to do, and sell me when they gets ready. By 1820, slavery has become an issue that begins to divide the nation. In the halls of Congress, angry voices are raised. Slavery is an evil damaging to the welfare of the entire nation. It is a good, and it is essential to the prosperity of the South. Up to now, under a gentleman's agreement between Northern and Southern leaders, the number of slave states in the Union has been kept equal to the number of free states. But now, the admission of Missouri to the Union as a slave state can throw the balance to the slave states. For the first time, there is heard the threat of dissolving the Union. If they will deny us admission to the new territories, if they will take away our property, I say, this Union. The violence over the admission of Missouri to the Union frightens the nation. Finally, Henry Clay proposes a compromise. Missouri will be admitted as a slave state, while Maine enters the Union as a free state. A line is drawn across the nation at 3630. Except for Missouri, everything north of this line will be free. Everything south, slave. But both sides realize the compromise has settled nothing. Already, John Quincy Adams sees the compromise as an omen of great trouble in the future. To aging Thomas Jefferson, the violence over the admission of Missouri is a warning, like a fire bell in the night. He says, I tremble for my country when I think that God is just. Jefferson's great fear is that after four generations of outrage, the slaves might rise up and take a terrible revenge. And slaves do rise up. In 1831, an uprising takes place in Virginia under a slave named Nat Turner. Turner believes that he is a prophet divinely chosen to lead his people out of bondage. He interprets a total eclipse of the sun as a sign that God is sent him. The time is now. Turner Rebellion lasts only 48 hours. Almost 60 whites, including the family of Turner's master, are killed. Then the whites mobilize and begin a slaughter of the guilty and the innocent that terrorizes Negroes for years to come. Nat Turner is captured and hanged. But the memory of what he has done is never forgotten. Nat Turner had been a Negro preacher. If a religious man like Nat Turner could rebel and turn murderer, what slave can be trusted? In each southern state, laws against the Negroes, the slave codes, are now made even more harsh. A southern judge rules, to make the submission of the slave perfect, the power of the master must be absolute. Under many of these stricter codes, to kill a slave while punishing him is not considered a crime. The slave codes rigidly control the slave's movements. No slave may be at large without a pass, which he must show any white person who demands it. 
Without a permit, a slave may not sell anything. He may not raise cotton, hogs, or even a mule. Under the slave codes, a slave is not recognized as the father of his children. A southern jury rules, the father of a slave is unknown to our laws. Under these laws, children are the property of the master to be sold at the discretion of the master. To make slaves even more submissive, they are encouraged to become religious. Yet while Negroes are encouraged to pray, it is forbidden to teach them to read their own Bibles. They do not need to read their Bibles to find salvation. Millions of those now in heaven never owned a Bible. Is there any great moral reason why we should incur the tremendous risk of having our wives slaughtered in consequence of our slaves being taught to read incendiary publications? To teach a slave to read is to open up a window on the world through which he may see the bright promise of freedom. And if he can write, he can forge a pass and escape. Negroes never cease the fight against slavery. One of the fiercest attacks on the institution is a book, An Appeal, written by David Walker, a free Negro. Henry Highland Garnett, William Wells Brown, Charles Raymond, and Sojourner Truth spend their adult lives helping other Negroes find freedom. In 1831, Soon after the Nat Turner Rebellion, while the South is stiffening the slave codes, a new voice arises in the North. I will be as hard as truth and as enterprising as justice. I will not equivocate. I will not excuse. I will not retreat a single inch. And I will be heard. His name is William Lloyd Garrison. His newspaper is the liberator. What he demands is nothing less than the complete and immediate abolition of slavery. Garrison is joined in his crusade by some of the best minds in the North. William Cullen Bryant, Wendell Phillips, and John Greenleaf Whittier. Henry David Thoreau says, Let your life be a counter friction to stop the machine. The abolitionists believe that if the federal government and the states will not abolish slavery, it is not only the right, but the moral duty of the individual to help slaves to freedom. They join in the work of the Underground Railroad that has been formed to help slaves escape. In houses that are stations along the railroad, slaves are given shelter by day and then passed on to travel through the woods at night to the next station. Thousands are helped to escape. Harriet Tubman, born a slave, becomes the most famous conductor on the railroad. After escaping to freedom in the North, she returns to risk her life again and again that others may be free. Furious, southern states offer a reward of $12,000 in gold for the capture of the slave woman. Frederick Douglass, a runaway slave, becomes the leader of his people and forms his own newspaper to help others find freedom. But to fight the abolitionists, to recover their valuable property as part of the compromise of 1850, the South wins the right to a new and stronger fugitive slave law. Even though the South has traditionally been for states' rights, it now demands that the full power of the national government be placed behind the recovery and return of runaway slaves. In the North, there are now thousands of Negroes freed through the help of the Underground Railroad. Are they to be returned? When a runaway named Anthony Burns is apprehended by federal marshals in the city of Boston, passions run high. An abolitionist leader says, I want that man set free in the streets of Boston. If that man leaves the city, Massachusetts is a conquered state. It takes 23 companies of state troops to hold back the mob of white sympathizers. 
And when federal marshals take the slave back in chains, it is through streets draped in black with flags at half mast. Soon afterwards, a book is published which explodes on the conscience of a nation. It is called Uncle Tom's Cabin, or Life Among the Lowly. Harriet Beecher Stowe's book is an immediate success. Before, slavery has been attacked as an abstract institution. Here is a story told in terms of people. Sympathies go out to good old Uncle Tom, faithful servant, sold down the river to pay his master's debts. Women weep for Eliza, willing to die rather than be separated from her beloved son, risking her life to cross the ice. At the most deeply moving moments, Harriet Beecher Stowe appeals directly to the hearts of her readers. If it were your Harry, mother, or your Willie, that were going to be taken from you by a brutal trader tomorrow morning, how fast would you walk? The issue of slavery is on every tongue, and now events accelerate to an almost inevitable climax. 1854, a new political party is formed whose key issue is anti-slavery. 1856, the Republicans nominate their first presidential candidate, John C. Fremont. Slavery and the recent Dred Scott decision becomes a key issue in the debate between Stephen Douglas and Abraham Lincoln running for the Senate on the Republican ticket in 1858. I now propose to propound a question. Can the people of the United States territory in any lawful way exclude slavery? I answer emphatically, no matter what the decision of the Supreme Court, slavery cannot exist a day or an hour anywhere unless it is supported by local police regulations. I suggest that the difference is none other than the difference between the men who think that slavery is wrong and those who do not think it is wrong. The Republican Party think it wrong. We think it is a moral, a social, a political wrong. We propose a policy that will deal with it as a wrong. 1858, Lincoln is defeated. But his words are not forgotten. 1859, a violent abolitionist proposes a wild scheme. John Brown proposes to free slaves and arm them to fight their masters. He will form a Negro state within the South and force emancipation, captured when he attacks a government arsenal at Harper's Ferry. Before he is hanged, John Brown speaks with a kind of biblical majesty. I believe that to have interfered as I have done on behalf of God's despised poor was not wrong, but right. To the abolitionists of the North, John Brown becomes a martyr. Over and over again, his final words are repeated as prophecy. I am quite sure that the curse of this guilty land will never be purged away but by blood. Eighteen sixty one, Abraham Lincoln becomes the first Republican president. Lincoln's purpose is to hold together the Union. He tries to reassure the South. I have no purpose to interfere with the institution of slavery where it exists. But the South remembers that this is the man who also said, The difference is none other than the difference between those who think slavery is wrong and those who do not think it is wrong. We propose a policy that will deal with it as a wrong. Forty years of compromise, and attempts at compromise have failed. 
By 1861, men on both sides are determined that there can be no more compromise. There will be other important issues, but slavery will be a major cause of the coming conflict.